Are you dreaming about travelling again? I bet you are. So give yourself a break and listen to my brand new travel podcast. It's made for people like you, by people like you. And in these podcasts, there will be interviews with different types of travellers and the strange characters that I've met on the road. With stories and anecdotes from the last 32 years of my continuous backpacking and working around the world. Also, there'll be cynical destination descriptions and the occasional travel tip to smooth your journey. And for all the squeamish listeners out there, I just want to say that no studio was used or abused in the making of these podcasts or any of the recordings. So please check it out, and I hope you like it. Oh, and by the way, my name's Alan. This week's story takes place in one of the oldest rainforests in existence, in Taman Negara Rainforest, Malaysia. Taman Negara means National Park in Malay. Having been there myself, I know that the spirit of the rainforest really comes alive at night, with a surge of animal sounds emanating from all over the forest starting around dusk, and it is truly magical. My hostel was set away from the small settlement on a hill which overlooked the forest and the river below. And I can vividly remember soaking up the atmosphere of that rainforest as I watched the sun go down most evenings. It's definitely one of the best memories of my time backpacking around Asia. Some 50 to 60 metres up in the treetops, high off the ground, are canopy walkways, originally constructed for researchers to study the complex life up there. And you get to walk around them and they're high up off the forest floor. And you're advised not to walk too close together or in unison as the walkways start to swing and sway. And falling 50 metres to the ground could ruin your day. When I was there, you needed a permit to go into the rainforest. I'm not sure if that's still the situation today, but with that permit, you automatically got a local guide to show you around and to make sure you didn't get lost, because apparently getting lost is a real problem, even during the day. My guide was great. He told me how he grew up playing as a kid in the forest, and he showed me which of the plants were good for medicine and which plants were poisonous and I saw the largest ant I've ever seen in my life. It was the size of my little finger. It was enormous. And all the permits for the safaris were fairly cheap back then. The cheapest was about 35 ringgit, which is about seven pounds or eight euros 20. You even needed a permit if you wanted to take photographs. Luckily, that was cheap too at five ringgit. Five ringgit was about a pound or one euro 40. But as I said, I have no idea of the situation today and what the prices are. To get into the thick rainforest, you needed to go upriver. And we use long, narrow canoes made from tree trunks. And travelling by boat is definitely the quickest and easiest way around. And if you ever plan to go there, my advice would be to try and go in and come out by boat if you can. It's a great experience, absolutely awesome. On my trip, I remember seeing a toucan fly across the front of the boat as we powered on upstream. And then when we arrived at the jetty, I saw a family of seven otters playing on the riverbank opposite. And one last thing before I get to the story. Here are some of the animals that live in the rainforest. In this national park, some are more dangerous than others. For example, pygmy elephants and rhinos are very close to extinction. You also have deer, sun bears, monkeys, leeches, tapir, poisonous frogs, wild boars, pythons, leopards, king cobra 
and even tigers. And I remember around that time when I was there, two accounts of attacks reported in the newspapers. Both were on locals who were working in the field around dusk. A woman was attacked by a tiger and a man by a python. So the dangers are real. Whether you see any of these animals or not, well that's another thing. Back to the story. This account was told to me by the German guy himself. He was about 30 years old and he spoke good English. I noticed him sitting on the sofa awkwardly and he looked uncomfortable and in real pain. So being the manager, I asked him if he was okay. And he told me this story. He'd gone to the rainforest, but didn't want to pay or to be part of an organised group safari. He said he organised a plan and he decided to go into the rainforest at night under the cover of darkness on his own. He also told me that he was well prepared. He had a good jacket, long trousers, hiking boots and a small day pack with his water and some chocolate bars and plus a torch. The torch unfortunately was the old fashioned type with the old fashioned batteries. But on his way out of the hostel, an Australian guy asked him where he was going, who then invited himself along for the adventure. They both had the same enthusiasm, but they had very different clothes. Because the Australian guy just wore a singlet, it's like a thin sleeveless vest, Bermuda shorts and flip-flops. I asked him how they got across the river. He said they took a rowboat tied up along the riverbank. Once across, they followed the narrow, well-worn trail using his torch to guide them into the rainforest. But he said that the rainforest was pitch black. You couldn't see more than a metre in any direction. And without the torch, you couldn't even see your hand in front of your face. And all the different noises echoing around the trees, they sounded as though they were actually next to you. The German was in front and the Australian behind. And they'd been walking for what seemed like about an hour or more. And they hadn't seen anything, he told me. The torch was beginning to fade and they were just thinking about returning to the boat when suddenly they saw something ahead of them walking on the track. As they got closer, they thought it was a large pig. Well, they were almost right because it turned out to be a tapir. A tapir is a brown and white animal in Malaysia. It's a pig-like animal with a long, flexible snout for a nose. They can also be found in South America, but apparently all species now are on the endangered list, which is a shame. A Malaysian male tapir can weigh anything up to 250 kilos, so it's not a small animal. As they came up behind it, it was grunting its way along the path in front of them. And with the torch getting dimmer and dimmer, the pig stopped suddenly. Now, the Australian, who was walking behind the German, leant around him and slapped the tapir hard on the arse. And with a loud squeal, it instantly swung round. And the German told me how in the chaos it was like a scene from an early black and white Keystone Cops movie. They almost fell over each other in the panic to get away. What followed next in the dark was chaos, with the dim torch flailing around casting ghoulish shadows all around them as they stumbled over each other in the panic to run up the track away from the tapir. Now with the Australian guy in front and the German guy behind, the tapir was closing them down fast. But the Australian was trying to run in flip-flops and anybody who's tried to run in flip-flops knows how difficult it is. As the German could easily have outrun the Australian, he told me how he tried to overtake him on the single track but couldn't because it was just too narrow. And with the angry tapir snorting aggressively behind him, the German screamed at the Australian to go faster, and he told me how the torch was almost useless now in the dark forest, then showed me how he'd pointed it over his shoulder as he ran, 
hoping it would deter the animal, but it had no effect. He decided to turn off at the next fork or next junction, leaving the charging animal to carry on chasing down the Australian, he told me. So at the next junction, he turned left, but so did the tapir. Now at this point, he said he was so exhausted and gasping for breath, he thought his lungs were going to explode. And luckily for him, he came upon a large tree in the middle of the track and decided to put the tree between him and the tapir. They danced around the tree for several minutes, keeping the tree between them, the German on one side, the tapir on the other, hoping sooner or later that he could outwit the animal and escape. And this charade went on for a few minutes, giving him enough time to catch his breath, he added. But this tapir wasn't stupid, and after a while it came charging around the tree at him, and as he turned to run, he tripped over a tree root and fell flat on his face in the darkness. He felt a sharp pain as the tapir bit into him, bit into him hard, on his arse. With adrenaline surging through every cell of his body, he instinctively jumped up, not knowing how bad the injury was. With his trousers ripped and blood running down his leg, he told me how he ran for his life. Not looking back, not even looking back for a second, he said. The tapir had got its revenge. At the end of the track near the river, the pain kicked in and he felt faint. And when he saw the light on in the warden's lodge, he knocked on the door for help. Immediately, he was driven to the nearest clinic, which was 45 minutes away. That's 45 minutes laying face down across the back seat of the warden's van. But once they'd got to the clinic, all they could do was give him a tetanus jab because they weren't qualified to stitch people up, he explained. So once again, laying across the back seat of the van, they drove for another 30 minutes until they eventually reached Gerentut Hospital. In the hospital, he was given 17 stitches in his backside. They kept him in overnight, just in case he developed a fever. But the next day he was discharged, and he got a taxi back to his hostel. Now I wanted to know, so I asked him, what did you say to the Australian guy? He said he'd never saw him, he never saw him again. The guy had gone. And why do you think he slapped the tapir? No idea, he replied. I asked if the injury still hurt. He said it did, and it hurt like hell. It was only that afternoon that he'd had the stitches out. And did you get into trouble, going into the rainforest at night without permission? I asked. No, but what happened to me would put anybody off. Then he told me, as he lay incapacitated in the back of the van on the way to the clinic, the warden told him that that particular male tapir was well known for attacking people and it had attacked several people over the last six or seven months after the people started to feed it. So that's the story. Make of it what you will. Slapping the tapir on the arse wasn't a wise move, and it certainly didn't help. But maybe the tapir smelt the chocolate bars in his bag. Thinking about it, he possibly got off lightly, considering there are some seriously dangerous animals living in that rainforest. So maybe he got off lightly. Thanks for listening. Well, that's all for this week, folks. And please remember, the same road can be travelled a thousand different ways. So get out there and make it your own. Until next week.